uh, Chamath Palapatiya responding uh, to critics, including Ray Dalio, saying that, look, uh, regulators will stop Bitcoin if it gets too big. He responded saying you can't stop Bitcoin. Obviously, you saw the China news. Uh, what's your take? Can, can Bitcoin be stopped or will governments win? You know, it's a great debate. However, the productivity enhancements that are available through cryptocurrencies and the entire infrastructure of decentralized finance are far too interesting for even governments. I don't think the U.S. government wants to fall behind in the development of new payment systems and services online that are being brought forward by the development in all kinds of centralized and decentralized finance systems. And so I, I don't see a, a situation where crypto is ever going away. Now, as far as being an investor in crypto, I tell people this all the time that ask me. I've declared recently by the end of the year, I'm hoping to be at 7% of our operating company's portfolio in, in cryptocurrencies in addition to level one and level two um, blockchains. And so I'm investing in a wide range of different crypto products as a strategy. But the idea that, um, uh, you know, that governments all around the world are going to synchronize and make Bitcoin illegal, I think is far fetched. And you, you know, the best way to look at it, if you're an investor, is either you believe in decentralized finance and you believe in centralized finance and you believe in Bitcoin and Ethereum and blockchains, or you don't. If you don't, stay in gold as a, as a hedge. And if you do, you know, tip, tip into it. Um, you know, I'm, I'm suggesting uh, I, you know, everybody has their own risk tolerance. And I must say the crypto space is very volatile. That's obvious. But I'm now going to be at 7% hopefully by year end. So I'm a believer in it. I'm an investor in it. I put many bets out with different companies now. They're developing products in these areas. And I'm pretty comfortable with where I sit. So I'm, I'm happy to listen to anybody. But I'm sorry, I don't agree if the answer is you have zero exposure to crypto. Right. 7% crypto. What is that? What percentage is in gold? You had some in gold before. Yeah, I have 5% in gold. Okay. So crypto for the first time is, is more than gold for me. Um, and I'm going to keep my gold. Right. I see no reason not to, not to, sell, to sell it. But right. crypto, it, it's not just betting on the price of Bitcoin anymore. There's so many other ways to invest, particularly in blockchain opportunities. Solana, Ethereum, you know, H, I mean, there's so many different level ones. And then, of course, level twos, the, the derivatives that are put on top of Ethereum and Solana and all the others. So I'm, I've really become a student of what's going on there. I yeah. think there's many markets yeah. where, for example, NFTs are going to be growing very quickly. I just see a lot of investment opportunity and I'm going to be an investor in that space. Well, let's talk about that now, because you have taken a big bet in DeFi and NFTs as well. Uh, let's start with uh, DeFi. I mean, your colleague, uh, Mark Cuban, has also said, look, this is going to be the biggest disruptor to banks. Uh, do you agree with that? I do. I do. I see lots of use cases for decentralized and centralized finance. And I'll give you an example of one that uh, I think is ripe for disrupting the currency markets. And currency trading are the largest markets in the world. Trillions of dollars every week are exchanged between different currencies for many different reasons. And every time you do that, you get clipped for two, three, four, five, six basis points. So if I want to buy a Swiss stock trading on Zurich, I have, and I have US dollars, I have got to convert my USD into Swiss francs and then buy the position. When I sell it, I got to do the thing in reverse. And I pay a lot of fees and there's a lot of friction. If we had an agreement, in a payment system between the two regulators in Switzerland or Euro or British pounds or Singapore or Asia, we could pay in one single currency or payment system that could be provided by a very secure decentralized finance or a stable coin like a USDC or a DAI. And I would avoid all those fees. It would cut the fees by 90%. And I think the pressure to do that will continue to grow now that we have the technology in ledger-based blockchains where we can actually track these trades in perpetuity. And so, yes, I believe there'll be disruption. Yes, I think a lot of uh, currency traders are going to lose their jobs over the next few years. And I think that's a good thing. It makes the whole system better, faster, more transparent, more secure, and above all, much cheaper, lower cost. Going back to Shamath, another point he brought up is that Bitcoin has officially replaced gold. Of course, he's going to say that. Um, do you agree? Has it officially replaced gold? No, nothing's going to replace gold. Gold's been tried and proven for 2,000 years. The Romans were hoarding it. Uh, I think what happens is gold will remain an asset class uh, in, in portfolios like mine and others. 
uh, as a property. I mean, you can't stake gold. You can't lend gold. I mean, it's very difficult to do it. You have to pay for product services and, and storage. Uh, at the same time, you know, with, with crypto, you have the opportunity to stake it or lend it and get some kind of um, appreciation of value through interest or whatever. So I think they're two different asset classes, uh, but I hold them both. I, you know, it's, it's fun to see the press create, you know, this controversy between gold and, and uh, Bitcoin, if you want to use that one. It, it's irrelevant because they're, they're completely different. And I think from my perspective, having exposure to both is a good idea. So I've got gold and I've got Bitcoin. In fact, now crypto is bigger than my gold holding. News of the week here, uh, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen warning that the U.S. government will run out of money by October 18th if something isn't done. She says failing to increase the debt limit would have catastrophic economic consequences. Kevin, uh, are you buying this warning? Do you believe it? No, neither is the market. We've seen this movie before so many times. You can't even sell tickets to it anymore. Nobody cares. They know they're going to work it out. Everybody understands the huge debate going on, you know, between the two different proposals. One, the infrastructure, uh, the 1.2 trillion, and then of course the three and a half trillion dollar social programs. These are all happening in the at the same time. So you've got a boiling cauldron of debate, and the market is sort of jaundiced to this kind of thing. They know a compromise will be worked out in every situation. It, it, it's. It's almost sad that, you know, politicians have to waste so much time dancing around like this when everybody knows it's complete, you know what? I mean, it's just, and that's why the market doesn't care. It doesn't care. It's seen it's, it's so often, but look, th this is the nature of where we are today. Very divisive. Clearly the parties don't agree on anything. Nothing gets done. And in some ways the market likes that. And I think it's, it's sort of healthy that they force each other to get realistic. Because almost, you know, this three and a half trillion dollar proposal is insane. It would make tax rates be so uncompetitive versus the global economy that it really can't happen. And, and most rational politicians know that. And Kevin, speaking about dancing around, uh, Fed Chair Jerome Powell coming out this week saying that the inflation he spoke of perhaps is not transitory. Now, why skirt around this issue? Why not just be straight up with the public? They're hedging their bets on one specific issue. They haven't stamped out the virus yet. They don't know how the economy is going to react if in November and December and January, the traditional flu season, it spikes yet again. We are not yet at a you know herd immunity. There's so many different cohorts in the US economy that have not decided have decided not to vaccinate, and that's caused major problems. And so Powell's hedging his best. I mean, if we get a complete spike again and thousands and thousands of cases piling into hospitals, it's going to cause a, you know, a grinding slowdown to the economy and he wants to have the tools available. So he's not ready yet to completely reverse tapering and you know, or, or, or have any option taken away from him. He wants optionality until we get through this next flu season. This is a critical time. What about this talk of minting a, a $1 trillion uh, platinum coin? Um, basically, it would be deposited at the Fed to pay off outstanding treasury bonds and not have to worry about the debt limit. Is that a possibility we could see or just makes a good headline? No, it makes a great headline. Chess that happening, practically zero. All of these radical ideas um, generally make a lot of press and go online and sometimes are reconsidered fake news. But at the end of the day, that's not generally how he would react. I mean, the economy itself right now isn't doing too badly. Consumer demand is pretty good. People are managing around COVID-19 and the Delta you know, variant. So I, I think there's a lot, of, a lot of ways to play this out, but really it's a 90 day window. So if you're an investor, get ready for more volatility, but you can watch these metrics come day by day. And of course we have to get through the debt ceiling thing. And then we've got to resolve, you know, how we're going to sign the bipartisan support for the infrastructure package should get signed. But, you know, the more progressive elements of the Democratic Party want to tie it to the social spend. And I don't think that's going to happen. Everyone's alluding to, you know, get, get ready. You said volatility that we could possibly see a correction in U.S. equities, you know, 10 percent, 20 percent, whatever. Uh, where do you stand on that? People have been calling for the correction of, of 10 to 20 percent for three years now. And. There's tremendous amount of liquidity in the market. The economy is doing quite well. There's a lot of stimulus in Europe as well as we have here. Another 1.2 trillion coming into the market. It's really hard to see that correction with that much stimulus. 
I mean, th that's really why we're at where we're at. We've never ever, in the, ever in, in, in 200 years, seen this amount of basically free money coming to the market. So I, I'm a little cautious about calling for a 20% correction. Anything can happen, of course, particularly if Delta came back in a vicious form. But you, you've got too much stimulus and, and you know, trying to time the market and, and selling your equities because you think we're having a 20% correction uh, is probably as, as dangerous, you know, as shorting it. You just don't know what's going to happen next.